I'm going into our studio. Well, before I do that, let me take a look at the If you look at the website, actually, I've separated out 11 and 12 from the rest of the chapter. So, if you look at the STAT website, I reset my uh, bookmarks. Okay. Um, I put the lecture in for the 16th, and these are the chapter 10 notes. There are not. Um, there are a few changes I've made, but I'll post them again when, I'm, when I make some more significant changes. But Chapter 10 is what I want to cover today also. It deals with the one-way analysis of variance. So I'm going to go in and look at the notes for chapter 10. I'll set the working directory to chapter 10. So last time, I'll do the markdown. Last time we started talking about the one-way analysis of variance, and this is where we have more than one, more than two groups. Although two groups is a, is a special case of that, but we looked at the two-group case in chapter eight, and we did the two-sample t-test. Here we're going to generalize that. Now it turns out that that two-sample t-test is a special case of what we'll be doing here. So in other words, in chapter 10, in chapter 8, that's not inconsistent with what we're doing in this particular chapter. We specify little a as the number of groups, and uh, little a equals 2 in chapter 8. It looks different, but it turns out that there's an equivalence, which I'll mention later on. And so we're testing the hypothesis that the means are all the same. And we're going to look at the within, in order to test that, we're going to look at the within group variability. First, uh, we're looking at the, I'm sorry, the variability among the groups compared with the variability within the groups. And that ratio should be approximately one on the, the null hypothesis, and I'll talk about that a little bit more now. It turns out that that distribution, if we assume certain things like normality of the error term, then it turns out that's an F distribution. And an F distribution is positive, and it is um, skewed to the right. So we'll let Y sub I J be the, uh, the, uh, the Jth observation in the ith group. And as I said, we're going to assume there are A groups, I equals 1 to A, and J, that's actually a slight change from the last time. J goes from 1 up to M sub I. In other words, we don't have to assume that the number of observations in each group is the same. And so M sub I says that Ops, you know, group one would have N1, group two would have N2, and so forth. And they don't necessarily have to be the same, but initially we're going to assume that the N sub I equals N for all I. So that's what's called the equal, um, equal sample case. The model we have is mu plus alpha sub I plus epsilon sub I J. And this is something that... Um, is innocent sounding. In other words, you can think of mu as being a grand mean, and then the alpha sub i is the deviation from the grand mean, depending on which group you're in. So that sounds simple enough, but that's not actually the way R does it, and it's not the way Sasser jumped to it. 
Uh, so, well, let's see. It may be the way SAS does it. There are, um, I think if you look at SAS, Jump, and R, they all do it differently. One of them, I believe, does it this way. Um, now, it turns out that we're just reparameterizing. So, mu and alpha sub i are the parameters that specify the linear model. The epsilon sub i j is actually the only thing that's random. In other words, the groups are fixed. So, if I have a groups, they are fixed. And it's the epsilon sub i j that is the noise in the system that's random. So, initially, um, we can define mu to be mu dot, which is the, if you look right here, maybe a little hard to see, but if you bring it up on your screen, you can see that the sum of the mu sub i over a, which is mu dot, and by dot I mean average, that's a notation often used in statistics, mu sub dot means it's averaged over something. In this case, I'm averaging it over the a group, so the sum of the the sum of the mu sub i, i equals 1 to a, divided by a, is what we call the grand mean. It's a parameter. We don't know it. We have to sample to get statistics to estimate these parameters. And I'll talk about estimation later on. But we usually just drop the mu sub dot and call it mu. And we call that the grand mean. And then alpha sub i will be equal to mu sub i minus uh, mu. That's the effect due to the ith treatment or the ith group. And then uh, we're assuming that the epsilon sub ij is a random effect due to sampling, the sampling variability. Uh, more specifically, we assume that the epsilon sub ij are distributed uh, normally with a mean of zero and a variance sigma squared. And a notation we often use as a short notation is epsilon is distributed independently I don't actually, I probably should put an N there, independently normal. Sometimes I put IIN for independently identically normal with mean zero and variance sigma squared, which I think is probably the best location, uh, the best uh, way of representing it. So I said that our test statistic would be the among group variation over the within group variation. So what do we mean by among group? and the within group. So I mentioned to you I'm sort of reworking this book and although I don't think I've redone this chapter's not been redone yet, but I can just show you a few a uh, few graphs that indicate what I'm talking about, since I can't use my iPad. So if I go to basic one-way analysis of variance, Here's the model that you know that that was used, and uh, I did want to mention, and I don't remember if I put it in my notes. Yeah, uh, the sum of the alpha sub i equals zero. The way we've defined this as the mu sub i minus mu dot, you can show mathematically that means the sum of the alpha, the sum of the treatment effects, the sum of the alpha sub i will in fact equal zero. You can algebraically take the the sum of the mu sub i minus mu dot, and the, the sum of the mu sub i will be, will, will be a times mu dot, but a times mu dot is the sum, so, um, so that sum of the alpha sub i will be zero. Now, there's actually a graph someplace. I'm not quite sure where it is. Um, might be in the second. Not seeing it, but I thought it was here. 
Hmm. Maybe it's in this first this first group. Too far. I was looking for a graph. Oh, yeah, um, it's not in the book yet, unfortunately. I have another version of this, which is what I'm working off of. Well, as I said, it's kind of unfortunate. Uh, let me try to explain this in words. If, in fact, all the groups are the same, think of it as overlapping normal distributions that have the same mean, u sub i. So all the means are the same. We have normal distributions, and they all overlap. We're assuming a common variance. So that's a lot of assumptions, and we need to check those assumptions, but if we make that assumption, then um, all the y bars for each group, y bar 1, y bar 2, up to y bar a, they should all be about equal, and they should be about equal to the grand y bar, which is the grand mean of everything. So in other words, you have a y bar, which we call the grand mean right here, and that grand mean is defined here. For the equal sample size, it just sums up every observation irrespective of the group and divides by a times n, which is the total number of observations. And then the, for the ith group, mu sub i will be the sum of the y sub i j, j equals 1 up to n, or it's n sub i if we don't have equal sample sizes. And so that's the ith mean. Now the point is, is that we expect the y bar i's and the y bar, the grand mean, to all be about the same under the null hypothesis. So in other words, um, so in other words, um, we would expect we would expect this quantity on the top, the y bar i minus the y bar, to be small. And in fact, that's true. So if we get an f-test, it's small. And it will be an f-test, but let me come back to that in a minute. Now that's going to be compared. In other words, you're comparing the mean, the y bar i's, to the grand mean. And if you think of it as a variance, if you think of the y bar i minus y bar squared over a minus 1, you're, you're actually summing over a1. So that's like a variance. And the reason we have to multiply by n is because the variance of a mean is sigma squared over n. And in order to compare that to the bottom one, we have to kind of get rid of that n in the denominator. So if you remember early on when we were talking to chapter 8 and we had y bar, the variance of y bar was sigma squared over n. So we're dealing with means here. And we want to compare it with things that aren't means. And so what we're doing is multiplying by n in order to get rid of that sigma squared n, that n in the denominator. You can think of it that way at least. It's sort of an intuitive way of looking at it. So that's why it's sort of like this part right here is like a variance, but we have to multiply by n. In other words, to, in order to get this to be comparable to what's down here. On the other hand, this, do you remember on the new sample t-test where we had two groups and we had to compute s1 squared and s2 squared? and then we pulled them together. And, um, and we wait, it was a weighted pooling based on the degrees of freedom if the sample sizes you know, were, were different. So it was like n1 minus 1 s1 squared plus n2 mi minus 1 times s2 squared over n1 plus n2 minus 1. Well, that's actually what we're doing in the second one. We're taking the sum of ij, y sub ij minus y bar. So if you look at that inner sum, if you look at that inner sum, and if you think of it, um, and then we're summing that, but in this case we have the same sample sizes, so um, this form is slightly simpler in this case. 
we don't have that degrees of freedom n1 minus 1. In other words, if n1 equals n2, if you think of it in the other case, then the n1 then it becomes n minus 1 and n minus 1 and the bottom becomes 2n becomes 2n minus 2 or 2 times n minus 1. The n minus 1's all cancel out. And so um, we have a similar thing here, that we're actually pooling within each group. So we can think of this like chapter 8, where we're pooling the two variances, s1 squared and s2 squared. Here we can think of it as s1 squared, s2 squared, and, up, and s3 squared all the way up to s sub a squared for all a groups. And we actually pool those. And you can show that that's actually equivalent to this. So we're pooling it. Now, the next part um, simply shows you what's called these are the corrected and uncorrected sum of squares. And then we end up uh, saying, okay, I want to compare, and we put it in a table. We, put a, we look at the among with m, and the degrees of freedom has to do with the fact that when I compute a variance, remember when I divided uh, by n minus 1, just a simple variance. So we have the sum of the y sub i minus y bar squared over n minus 1. Well, that n minus 1 is actually the degrees of freedom. And you lose, one, you lose one degree of freedom because you have to estimate mu in that case. And it turns out that that distribution, if you assume normality, is a chi-square distribution with n, n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Now, in this case, and you may recall that, for example, when we did the two-sample t-test, we had, we had to estimate two parameters, and therefore we lost two degrees of freedom. So it was n1 plus n2 minus 2 in the denominator when we pulled them. Well, in this case, it will be a times n minus a. We lose a degrees of freedom in the denominator. So the degrees of freedom within will be a times n minus 1. Well, we can think of it as a times n minus a. We're losing a degrees of freedom because we're estimating a parameters. But the within, again, this is like doing a variance on the means. And, it's, and in that case, we divide by a minus 1. And so we have a minus 1 degrees of freedom. So here are the formulas. Here are the formulas we give. Um, those are computing formulas. And if you look at the book, did I close the book? If you look at the book, maybe I should leave it open. There's some useful things in here. The book will actually give you detailed computations. Here are the graphs that I was um, talking about, which aren't in this version yet. Okay. And if you look at the book, it goes through sort of the steps in some detail about how you compute these. Now, the philosophy I have is that um, you're probably not really going to even in a simple case. It's certainly possible to compute the one-way analysis of variance. It's even possible to compute it if the n sub i's are not the same. It's not too hard. Once you get, but you wouldn't want to do it if you have very many observations, even in this simple case. But the book does, does show you, you know, how this is done. So, um, you can show algebraically if you were going to do it by hand, you would not want to use these two formulas up here. And the reason is you have to compute the mean and you have to, phys you have to actually subtract it from each one and then you have to square those differences. That turns out to be a little bit hard to do on a calculator if you're using a calculator. Because probably right now, if you, have, if you use a calculator at all, it's probably a good thing. And so... You know, you can get very sophisticated calculators as apps now. But, again, it becomes very time-consuming. Now, it's easier to compute the sum of squares of things. And so if you, look, if you look at these formulas, they're called the computing formulas. And the total, what's called the total uncorrected sum of squares, simply squares every value and adds it up over all groups, all values. And then corrected group sums of squares sums it for every group and squares it, and then sums over the groups and divides by n. So, um, and then 
for the correction factor, it just sums everything over all groups, all n times a observations, or if the unequal sample size, it's the sum of the n's of i's. It sums everything, it squares and divides by n times a. So if you do it that way, it turns out that you can compute the among, and we often write this in what's called an analysis of variance table, although that's not the complete table, but that's part of it. In other words, analysis of variance table, which R computes for you, at least you can get it, will give the sources of variation, in which case we have an among and within. Now this also gives a total, but that's just a convenience. Uh, what we really use is the among and within in terms of what we do um, when we're testing. Uh, it turns out you can take A minus CF to get um, the among variation and T minus A to get the within, and then T minus F, um, CF is what's called the corrected. So uh, the book goes into some detail about how you would calculate these. What I'm going to show you is how to do this in R. Now, as I indicated, if I take the sum of squares due to A, which is defined here, that's the deviations of the y bar sub i's around the grand mean y bar. If I take that sum of squares and divide by A minus 1, that's called the mean square. Now, that estimates sigma squared under the null. And the denominator, which takes, it takes the sum of squares of the deviations of each group, it takes the sum of squares of the deviation of y sub i j minus y bar sub i. In other words, that's a y bar sub i. So it takes the deviations around each group. And in that case, um, um, we're pooling across groups. And if we divide by, if we divide by the total sample size minus a, we can think of it as a times n minus a or a times n minus 1, then that's called the mean, mean square for error. Now, that also estimates sigma squared. In other words, both of those estimate sigma squared under the null. Now, what does that mean? That means if the mu sub i's are all the same, then they're both estimating sigma squared, and you'd expect that ratio to be about 1. So if that ratio is a lot bigger than 1, and we only reject for large values of f. And the reason is, is because if the mu sub i's are different, we're squaring things. So some may, you know, if I look at mu dot and I look at the alpha sub i, some are going to be negative, some are going to be positive. But we're actually going to be squaring things. And so we're only going to be rejecting in that upper tail. Because again, if you look right here, the y bar sub i minus y bar, the grand mean, we're squaring those. So if there are differences in the means, and the y bar sub i's minus y bar are estimating those, those alpha sub i's, those effects, we're squaring those. And so if they're different, then that numerator will be bigger. Now, if they're different enough, that numerator will be big enough that we're going to reject. Now, it turns out this distribution f under the null, what we call f, is, is actually what we say is an F distribution. In other words, it's distributed as an F, and it has two degrees of freedom, the numerator degrees of freedom and the denominator degrees of freedom. The numerator degrees of freedom is an A minus 1, and the denominator is a, uh, A times N minus A, or A times N minus 1. Okay. So uh, if you look at the back in the book, there are F tables, but of course R is not going to do that. So this would be the classical way of doing this. And if you, um, you know, it, it, it's maybe worthwhile computing this by hand once in your life. But you probably aren't really going to do it, whether you're using jump or SAS or R. <clears throat> Whichever you're using, um, you can very quickly do, do these types of tests. Now, what's important is to understand a little bit behind it so that if you get this F test, it's just not this number that's magically there. What is, what is important to understand, and one of the reasons that maybe it's important to see this formula, is under the null hypothesis, the y bar sub i's should all be about the same. And therefore, they should be about equal to y bar. So therefore, those sum of squares of deviations should be small. 
under the null hypothesis. <clears throat> and that's the intuition behind it. Now, mathematically, why it's an F distribution and what the mathematical characteristics of the F distribution, that's beyond this course. That's in our theory courses, like 561. <clears throat> so, you know, to derive that as an F is not something we're going to do in this course. So what I'd like to do is to, and this data is available in the data sets, <clears throat> this, <clears throat> this first example uh, has four different types of saws, and we're looking at the kickback, and I guess it's the angle of the kickback that you get from your sawing. And so we have data, and I'm trying to remember how many observations are in each one of these. Actually, um, we actually have that file. There's the saw data, and you should be able to download it. Remember, on that first page of the syllabus, I have the different data sets. And you see there are A, B, C, D. There are four, four models. And there are five observations. There are five observations for each of the four models. And so um, A is 4, right, in this case, and N equals 5. So this is the equal sample case. So in this case, we have A equals 4 and N equals 5. All the incivives are the same in this case. So let's go back here. Now, one of the first things that you might want to do, well, let's first of all read in, and then we'll look at the first five, and then we'll attach it. One of the first things you almost always want to do is plot it, and, and one of the best plots, um, interesting, why is that not working? That's strange. I'm using the defaults. Oh, no, I'm not. Well, I'm just going to, I'm going to take this out. Um, I don't know whether that's already set it because I ran it. Um, yeah, I'd, but here it is. It ran it here because it's not a problem with margins. But apparently our studio has problems with margins. But that's it. Um, that's the, um, a bo those are side-by-side -side box plots for each of the A, B, C, D, for each of the four groups. That middle in the, the box, the bottom and top represent the quartiles, if you don't know what a box plot is. The middle line represents the median. So it appears that there may be some differences. Um, but there's also quite a bit of variability. And I think the, uh, the, basic, um, the basic block plot is given a min and the max. And so we can see there appear to be differences. There also appears to be some skewness in some of the cases. In other words, you would expect the median to be about in the middle of that box if, in fact, there were no skewness. So uh, it appears there may be a little bit of skewness, particularly in, in A and maybe D. And, but it does appear that maybe there are some differences. Now, what we're testing initially is that the null hypothesis says that there's no difference. Mu 1 equals mu 2 equals and so forth. The alternative says there's some inequality. There's some difference. Now, what we're going to talk about in a little bit is, okay, if we reject the null hypothesis, then which means are different? Is A different from B? Is A different from C? What's different? And that's called a follow-up multiple comparison. So, so if we go back, we can fit. This is the way we fit the model. Fit solves. We use the function LM. And we just have the angle tilde model. In this case, the model means the the model of the sol, A, B, C, D, 
So uh, we use the notation. We can think of that as saying angle is modeled as, I mean, angle is modeled, yeah, I've got modeling there twice. I'm, angle is modeled at, you know, in terms of the categorical variable model. <coughs> and, uh, and we save it in an object, a model object, which is actually an LM object if you look at the class of it. So if we, if we uh, execute this, and if we wanted to see what the class is, we could say, well, the class of FitzSaws, and FitzSaws is just something I picked. It's class LM. So it's an LM object. And if I actually just sort of, if I just sort of print fit models, there's a default print, uh, print solves in this case. If I just print that, what it does by default is it prints the formula, and then it prints the estimates. Now you might ask, why is it? Uh, if I have mu plus alpha sub i and i goes from 1 to 4, it looks like there's one mu and there are four, there are four alphas. So why aren't there five parameters? Can anyone tell me? There was a clue that we've already talked about. It would appear that we should have... Why don't, where's model A? Yeah, there's a multicollinearity. The sum of the alpha sub i is equal zero. Well, that's not actually true here because R doesn't assume that. The model we had above, the model we had above said mu is the grand mean and the sum of the alpha sub i is equal to zero. That's not what R does by default. The problem is, however you define it, we have one too many parameters. We can't estimate all five parameters. We have to put a constraint. And the constraint that I talked about above was the sum of the alpha sub i equals zero. And that's classically the way you'll see books do it. Unfortunately, that's not the way. Well, I don't know if it's fortunate or not. But what R does is set alpha one equals zero. That's what R does by default. Now, the nice thing about R is that you can actually you can actually um, define any constraint you want. You can define your own constraint. It has some built-in constraints. In fact, it has a built-in constraint that's sum of the alpha sub i equals zero. And we'll do that in, a, in just a little bit. So R has flexibility. Now, I forget which is which. Jump and say us. One of them sets the last alpha to be zero, and the other sets the sum of the alpha to be zero. And I can't remember which is which now. So in other words, I don't believe SAS and Jump, which is made by the same company, make the same assumption. I forget which one is which. I'll have to check that out. But I'm pretty sure they don't do the same thing. We need a constraint. You could have any number of constraints. But we need a constraint because um, it turns out that we, we do have multicollinearity. Now, the reason is that we can actually write uh, we can write the model in a slightly different way. We can write write it in terms of dummy variables, where it's one if it's in the ith group and zero otherwise. So think about that. If I write a dummy variable that's one if it's in the ith group and zero otherwise, and that's for the alphas. But I also have a grand mean which we can think of as having a one in front of it. So the point is that, you know, that I, that if I sum, for example, if I sum all the dummy variables on a given row, it will always sum the one, which is what I have before mu, and therefore I have a collinearity. Now I'm sort of waving my hands about this, but if you do this in matrix notation, which is what says really does. If you do it in matrix mot notation and you have your dummy variables, then um, you can see that you'll be able to easily see that the sum of, if you try to put in dummy variables that are one for the ith group and zero for the other three in this case, 
that the sum of those dummy variables will always be one, which is the same as the um, the same as the coefficient for mu, and therefore we have a collinearity when we have a system of linear equations. How you get rid of it? Um, it doesn't really matter, but it sort of matters for the interpretation. How do I interpret the alphas, for example? So how do I interpret the alphas here? I'm really now comparing everything to the first group. I said alpha 1 equals 0, and so alpha 2 is actually, uh, well, what happens is that the intercept is really mu 1. And therefore, the alphas would be the difference between mu 2 and mu 1. So it's actually a comparison between the second group and the first and the first in this case, the third and the first, and so forth. So it's actually comparing, in our case, everything to the first. Now, if I set the last one equal to zero, I'd be comparing everything to the last. So uh, um, this is uh, one of the sort of confusing areas that um, is not talked about enough. And so if you would go in and run the same data set in R, jump, and set. SAS, you would look at the results and you would say, what's going on? Now, um, I'm also going to print out, and I don't have this in the text, but I'm going to print out summary of the, of the object, fit cells. And what you do is you get estimates in the standard hours and t-test over here, but I'll come back to that in a minute. These values right here, the, the 33, 10, 16, and minus 2, they were the same as you got up here. In other words, if I just print the if I just put the object itself, it only prints out the coefficient estimates. That's all. In order to get more information, we can do summary. And then summary gives estimates for the individual uh, mu's and alphas. But it reduces it so I don't have collinearity. It puts the constraint in, in other words. And therefore, I have no alpha 1. Alpha 1 is 0. I know what it is. OK, so now we haven't talked about the standard errors and the t-test and so forth yet. And so I'll come back to that. What I want to do now is there's another function um, there's another function called ANOVA. So I'm going to do ANOVA, and this will give us an analysis variance table, and this very much looks like what we were doing before. So what is the model? The model is the, notice it has three degrees of freedom. What is that? That's A minus one. That's four minus one is three. What is called model here is the among variation, the among group variation. That's the first line. The residual of 16 degrees of freedom. How did you get 16? Does anyone know? N minus. I found my N, N. Yeah, if you say capital N, yeah. where capital N is, is the sum of the N sub i's, or in this case, N times A. Yeah, it's the total sample size minus A, or the number of groups. So it's 20 minus 4. 20 is the total number of observations minus 4. Now, if the sample sizes were not different, it would be the sum of the n sub i's minus a. So if the sample sizes were different, that would be the sum of the n sub i's, i equals 1 to a, minus a. Or you could think of it this way. It's the sum of the n, if you take n sub i minus 1 and put parentheses around it and sum that, then that would be capital N minus A if you let capital N be the total sample size. So we have 16 degrees of freedom. So, so here we've computed the, um, this is the sum of squares of A, and this is the sum of squares of E. So if you look at my notation, the sum of squares from, so these first, what you're seeing in that output are those first two lines. It doesn't give the total line. You don't really need the total line. The reason we do the total line is if you were going to do it by hand, and do you see how we compute the within? It's t minus a, 
where t is the uncorrected total sum of squares. So in other words, you know, we don't really need that line in Alice the variance table, but if you're doing it by hand, you need to get that capital T. But that's only for a hand calculation. So that analysis of variance table corresponds to the among and the within. Now, again, what they're calling it is they'll, they'll label whatever the, on the right-hand side of the tilter is what they'll label that first line. But that's the among. So we get a sum of squares. So how do we go from the sum of squares to the mean square? It, the mean squares are what estimates sigma squared under the null. Yeah, we, well, we divide sum of squares by degrees of freedom. Okay. The mean, in other words, the sum of squares divided by, in this case, the 1080 divided by 3 is 360. That's the mean squared. So again, if I look back here, if I take the sum of squares and divide by degrees of freedom, notice the degrees of freedom is a minus 1, and this is the sum of squares. And the error term, if I take the sum of squares error times a times n minus 1, Okay, which is a n minus a. And so this gives us this ratio, right? Gives us the ratio, which we can then divide the numerator by the denominator. We get an F test, which is 3.55. And now you ask the question, is that significant? Well, in the back of the book, there's a table where you could go look. And if you didn't have a computer, that's what you would have to do. But this gives you a p-value of 0 0.038. So what is our conclusion? Well, if we're testing at the 5% significance level, well, we're less than that, right? Yeah. Our p-value is less than 0 0.05, and therefore we reject the null hypothesis. And we say there's at least one difference. So that's, that's the test. By the way, this one-way analysis of variance is sometimes called a one-way one completely randomized model. And the reason we do that is if we had, uh, in this case, with SALs, we actually sample five of each of four types. And we say the distribution is the same. But in a lot of experiments, you actually can apply the subjects, the, the treatment to the subject. So if you select, if you select 20 subjects, let's say, and you have four treatments, and you randomly assign five to each of the four treatments, then we would be completely randomizing the treatments to the samples. And that's sort of an ideal situation. In our model here, we didn't actually assign, I mean, a sol a type A is type A. And there were a bunch of type A sols made, and there were a bunch of type Bs, and we randomly sample, you know, we randomly sample five of each. So that's sort of depending on a slightly different theory, rather than randomly assign treatments to subjects. <clears throat> we're doing a similar thing in that we randomly draw out. So if you had a manufacturing facility making sols, you would have some procedure that Okay, over the next so many periods of time, I'm, there are going to be hundreds of saws coming off the assembly line, and so I randomize numbers, and I say, okay, I'm going to pick the 40th, the 82nd, the 120th, et cetera. So we could still assure by randomly sampling that, that we don't have bias. And that becomes an important consideration on all these types of studies. So if these saws were truly manufactured and we were sampling off the assembly line, then uh, we would have to be careful how we do it to, to, in order to avoid bias. Now, a lot of people think um, if you have a treatment, for example, in, cl in the clinical trials, and you have uh, what's going to happen is maybe you have a certain treatment and you have controls, meaning they get a placebo or they don't get a treatment. In clinical trials, what you have to do is randomly sample one group that gets the treatment, and the other group does not get the treatment. And that's always hard for sometimes for people to do if you really think the drug is going to be effective, because you know that some people aren't getting it, and they, no one knows. No one knows who gets it. The patient doesn't know, nor does the person who administers it. 
In other words, that's called a double blind study. In a double blind study, the person administering the drug doesn't know whether it's a placebo or a drug, and the patient doesn't know. And but if you agree to go into this clinical trial, then um, it's kind of the luck of the draw uh, as to whether or not you really get the treatment. Okay, going back to this. Um, so we, we have, what we conclude at this point is that there appears to be a difference. And we look at the graph and we could say, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. But we'd like to be a little more precise about uh, that, and that is what we call multiple comparisons. And I plan to sort of enhance what's in the book about multiple comparisons, uh, mainly because R makes it possible to enhance. <clears throat> and um, so, at any rate... So if you look at the output, what I'm going to do now is look at another example. I'm sorry, this is the, okay. I'm going to look at another example, and this deals with, I think it's seven types, in psychology it deals with seven types of disorders. And this researcher has measured uh, IQ tests, and what uh, she wants to know is, is there a difference in IQ among the uh, children? that have uh, these seven different disorders. Now, the problem is, in this case, uh, a lot of times what happens in this type of situation, and you know, you gotta be careful with this, but what happens is a particular researcher is running a clinic in a large hospital, and you have a certain number of kids who come through, and this kid has this disorder, another kid has another disorder, and so forth. And so, in that case, it's not as if it's not as if you have a bunch of kids in this group, you're going to sort of subject a disorder on this group and give this other group. You don't do that. They have disorders. They come in and get help. And so in this case, it's very unlikely the sample size is going to be the same. In other words, I have a group of kids. Over time, this practitioner may have a group of kids coming in that have disorder A and disorder B and so forth. And so the sample size is typically, in that example, not going to be equal. Now, the thing you have to question here is, is there some bias, you know, in terms of selectivity, in terms of who comes in to get treated? Um, it might be that, for example, there could be cultural differences. If you have more money, you may come in. If you don't have money, you don't come in. So there could be, uh, it, it could be that, uh, you know, it could be that certain groups of kids, and that may affect the IQ, don't come in versus others that do come in. And so um, this is the type of situation where you have to be trouble, be concerned about bias. Some, bias is something you always have to be concerned about when you're running experiments. So if we actually uh, look at the data set, th this data set is called disorders, and so here's the disorders data set, and you can see that we just call the treatments one to seven, and notice that the first one has three, the next one has, what, four, and then five, and then three, and then two, and then four, and then two. So you see the sample sizes are pretty different, uh, but that's, you know, that's, that's what happens. I don't think, unfortunately, I plotted this one. I'll have to put a plot in. But the point is, is that uh, the point is, is that all those formulas can be slightly modified. If you were doing it by, uh, you can do you can do the n sub i unequal by hand for the one-way analysis of variance. When you go beyond the one-way analysis of variance to two factors, that is a two-way analysis of variance, and you don't have unequal. If you're n sub i, in this case it's n sub i j's because you have a factor a and a factor b, and so you have two subscripts, one for factor a, one for factor b. If the n sub i sub h are different for the two-way analysis of variance, forget it about doing it by hand. It becomes very difficult. But you could do it here. As I said, there's a slight, uh, at some point I'll, I'm going to put in the very, you can take these formulas here and here and just do a slight modification. For example, up here, I simply take the n and put it in front of the sum sign with an n sub i. In other words, there's, there's simple adjustments to these formulas if the n sub i's are not all equal. 
and um, and, and the second formula, uh, well, again, we could view that that denominator as the sum of the n sub i is minus a, or the sum of in parentheses n sub i minus one. So th th there are just slight slight variations, you know, of this. But again, we um, we also have this n sub i minus one up here because it's like it's like it's like that formula in chapter eight when you pull two, but we extend it to a. So by doing slight variations of these formulas, um, uh, we can do the une unequal n case. Now the book actually gives the variations for these formulas down here, and if you were going to do it by hand, that would be the way you would do it by hand. So getting back to the um, disorder example, and I don't have too much discussed it here other than the fact of how you run the R code. So let's let's go back and look at it a minute. So if we go back and look at the R code, then we're going to read it in. And notice that notice that here I make sure that I convert the type. See the type goes from what? One to seven? What would happen if I wouldn't put that statement in? And why didn't I need it above? Why didn't I need it in the first degree? Why do I need this? I say disorder dollar sign type. And type, in other words, type is in the data. Uh, disorders is a data frame. And it, it actually um, uh, has two columns. The first column will be 1 through 7, which is the type. And the second column is the IQ, right? But it would treat 1 through 7 as continuous. It would be as if you were doing a regression of x versus y. And that's not what we want to do, because 2 doesn't mean it's twice as, you know, in other words, 2 is just a label. There's no numerical scale here. I have seven treatments, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And people do this. Just make sure that you don't accidentally run it and not make it a factor, because in this case, it would treat it like a regression. But there's no numerical scale. Seven is not bigger than one. I mean, there's no, we're not comparing them. Sometimes you have ordinal data, you may do this. If, in fact, you have categories, but they're ordered, that's called, an or, that's called uh, ordered, which is an ordered type of categorical variable. And R supports that. And sometimes you might do it there. But uh, again, even there, it's kind of shaky. Uh, so I'm going to say factor. I'm going to convert it so that it is, in fact, a factor. And then I'll plot, the, there's the uh, first five of them. Now, if I would have attached, I'm going to attach disorders. You notice I had to put the dollar sign here. I had to put disorders dollar sign type, and in factor disorders type. That's because if I would have just typed in type, it wouldn't have found it in the search path. The data frame, in other words, the names of the variables are inside. You'd find the name of the data frame. So, for example, if I look over here, um, let me go back and get rid of this. So, if in fact, let me go back and re-execute this code. So, if I execute the code, you can see d disorders is here. Now, suppose I tried to type in, well, suppose I put in type right here. Well, it's going to find it because I've already attached it. Um, and now if I try to put in type, it doesn't find it. There's another command, search. So if I put in search, when you type in a name in R, um, it, try, it, fi it tries to, first of all, find it in the global environment. That's this right here, your global environment. If it doesn't find it there, then it keeps looking down. It looks in SOLs. I've attached SOLs, so it looks inside SOLs, and it doesn't find type in SOLs. And it keeps going down, and if it doesn't find it by the time it gets to the last one, it gives you an error and says you can't find it. Now, suppose, now notice that Notice that disorders is not there. So if I attach, you know, if I say, uh, 
Um, well, but I can do this because that dollar sign allows me, uh, for example, if I simply do, if I simply do disorders, dollar sign, um, is IQ small letters, okay, so IQ, um, if I use a dollar sign, it will extract that element from the data frame, which is a vector. So it extracts the IQs by using the dollar sign. But that's kind of a nuisance to have to print out the data, the data set name or the data frame name, dollar sign, and the variable name. That means you have to do a lot of typing. You're always you're typing in disorders more. You know, every time you use a variable, you have to proceed it with the disorders. So what happens is I, I can attach and put in the search place the data frame called disorders. And the way you do that is you simply attach it. So if I attach it, now notice that nothing changed here, but now if I look, if I look at search, you'll notice that disorders is in the second position. Now, if I, um, how do I find out what's in each of these? Well, if I do, if I do an LS without any arguments, it it actually tells you what's in this very first one by default. LS without arguments says a global space, which is what's here. But if I do an LS two, it tells you what's in the second position. So, what's in the second position? So, if I do an LS two, ah, IQ and type. So when I type in, I no longer have to put the qualified data frame. In other words, I no longer have to put disorders dollar sign some variable name. I can just use the variable names now because if I type in IQ or type, they'll find it in this second position. When I detached it before, it removed it from the search path. So detach removed it. So uh, again, I... I had the IQ, so if I type in IQ now, again, it finds it. So I no longer have to go through the, the hassle of putting data frame name, dollar sign, and then the name of the variable I really want. Does that make sense? You'll figure it. If you forget to attach it, you'll figure it out very quickly, or hopefully you will if we waste a lot of time worrying about it. So at this point now, I'm going to fit the model, which is this IQ tilde type. Now, remember, if I would not have made type a factor, you would have one degree of freedom associated with type, and it would be like a regression model where I'm trying to predict, uh, I'm trying to predict IQ from these arbitrarily labeled numbers 1 to 7, which would be completely meaningless. So I'm going to fit the object. And now, just to sort of see what things look like, I have fit disorders um, with an S. And so what it does, again, it gives the model, and it just, it, this, only gives, this only gives the uh, estimates. Um, and that's it. Now notice type 1 is not there. Again, by default, R sets alpha 1 equals 0. Now on the other hand, um, this gets a little bit ahead of what we're going to do later on, but if I do a summary, S-U-M-M-A, if I do a summary of uh, fit disorders, then that is a, what this is, is to give a summary and it breaks out each degree of freedom separately. So each one of those has one degree of freedom. It gives these estimates, and these estimates right here are the same as you got just by specifying the model. It gives the standard errors, it gives the t-test. Now I'm going to talk about these later on. I'm not going to talk about it today. But we will talk about what those tables mean. And in particular, I want to contrast setting alpha equals 1 equals 0 to the sum of the alphas of 1 equals 0. It's important that you understand these distinctions because you're really going to get confused. You know, if you're one day using jump and the next day you're using R, 
you know, say, wow, they look different. Well, they're not really different. Um, it's just that you reparameterize different, and you can reparameterize in an infinite number of ways. Um, and that's because you have what's called a singularity or collinearity. So we can do an ANOVA, so I'll go down and do the ANOVA. And when I do the ANOVA, notice, how did we get six for the degree? So notice type. That's the among variation, the among group variation. In this case, the disorders, the among disorder variation. Okay, there are seven, right? So seven is A. A minus one is six. And the sum of squares, what I call SS sub A, is 2796.6. I divide the sum of squares by the degree, its degree is freedom. I get a mean squared. That estimates sigma squared. For the residual, how did I get 16? Well, I got the total number, which is what? Well, it's 7 plus 16, so it must be 23. So I should have this over here. It's 24, but remember the top one is, is the label. So there are 23 observations, right? So, um, so when I look at this, I have 23 minus A, which is 7, so I get 16 degrees of freedom. And the sum of squares of error, which is pulled over, it's the variation pulled over the seven groups, uh, that's 915.1, and the mean square divides to 915 by 16, and then we do our F test, and the F is 8.15, 8 roughly. And notice the p-value is extremely small, 0 0.0003. It's about 3 in 10,000. In other words, the probability this could happen by chance, you know, is about 3 in 10,000. So, in other words, the, the null could be true, right? But the probability you'd get something this extreme or more extreme is about 3 in 10,000. So what does a rational person say? You could either say the null is true and something very rare happened, or you could say, well, this doesn't look like the null is true. And, you know, when we sort of get below, you know, when we, when we say um, 5 and 100, that's the point out of 5, right? We're starting to say this is unusual when it gets less than 5 and 100. You know, and it's, um, that's somewhat arbitrary cut off, but it's become convention. Again, um, the problem is, is that if you make, you, you, we're sort of ignoring power. Power is the probability that you reject the null when you should reject the null. Okay? And the type 2 error is the probability to accept the null, you know, when you shouldn't. Okay, so you don't want a large type 2 error. And the problem is there's a trade-off between the type 1 error and the type 2 error. And that also then affects the power. So, you know, the, there's always this, you know, how do I pick, how, how, what significance level do I pick? Um, do I pick 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.01 to make it 1 in 100? Again, you know, that depends. Um, you know, that sort of depends on whether, how concerned you are um, about making a type 2 error. A lot of ecologists recently uh, for, for environmental studies have moved more to the 0.1 level so that they can control the type 2 error better, make it smaller, which makes the power greater. Okay, how are we doing for time? 12.45. That's it. Um, so let me just say, what we're going to start on next time is multiple comparisons. You should be reading the book. In other words, um, the first thing we're going to do is we'll look at, um, we'll look at a situation called Fisher's LSD. And um, this is a very simple way to say which group is different from which other group. And we look at all possible pairs. Now we have to be careful. If we have seven groups like we did with the disorders, how many possible pairwise comparisons can I, can I, can I do? So, okay. Yeah, how many combinations of seven things to seven factorial over five factorial times two factorial? Okay, so it's yeah, it's six times seven divided by two. So it's forty-two.
Okay. So uh, the problem is this. If I just did, uh, and here's what, here's what some people do. They just do a bunch of t-tests. They don't pull it. They just do a bunch of t-tests. But there's a certain dependency here. And what happens is, then you say, okay, even if the null is true, what is the probability on the chance I, that I uh, reject 1? Just by chance. Well, if you do 21, you know, there's maybe a very, even if there is no difference, you can actually compute the probability that you get at least one rejection, even though there is no difference. And if we want to control that probability, that's called a family-wise error rate, we want to control all the possibilities, then there are certain procedures we, we can use. Okay. I may try to uh, add to these notes to bring in some of these things, because the book is a little bit limited in the approaches it takes. Any questions? So we'll stop here today. Continue reading on the book. The assignment is due next Wednesday. I will be giving a Chapter 9 assignment over the next few days. So for those of you that went through Chapter 8, I'll give you the next one. But I am going to expand the discussion a little bit into the different types of errors. Uh, there's also a type, a more general type, called a false discovery rate. So there are different multiple comparisons based on family-wise error rates, false discovery rates, and there are some very conservative approaches and more liberal approaches, so we'll talk about multiple comparisons next time. Yeah, I have a question. Let, let me first of all note today. Yeah, but let me stop the recording.